Oops. Hey, Adriana. Great. Hello, good afternoon. How are you doing? I know it's tiring, the last session of the day. Hopefully we'll keep it very lively and very interesting for you folks. We're gonna have some things for you to do and for us to talk to each other. So my name is Andrew Lee. I am uh, here with Ryan King and Sarah Snyder from the Smithsonian Institution in the United States. And I'm gonna be talking today about a new initiative that was started in 2024 called the GLAM CSI, the Contributor Study Initiative. And if you want, there is the slides at that QR code, or you can go to the page on Eventier and go straight to the slides there, because we will be clicking on some things today. So let's tell you very quickly about the GLAM CSA project. Overall, it is a project to assess the contribution pipeline in the Wikimedia technical infrastructure for supporting cultural and heritage partnerships and projects by documenting key user stories. So some of you might not have heard the phrase user stories formally, but we'll explain what that is. But the idea is to try to take down some key uh, experiences that we can design around and to figure out how to do better in the Glam Wiki community. Um, sorry, you can also get to the project page on Meta by going to Glam CSI, and this is a project for this calendar year of 20. 24. And I'm going to talk a little bit slower to make sure the folks who are listening in other languages can pick up on this. So as I mentioned, we've got uh, Ryan, myself, and Sarah from the Smithsonian. And then also want to make sure we acknowledge folks in the Wikimedia Foundation that were great supporters of this work that made it happen. Giovanna, say hello, Giovanna. Uh, we have Jasmine Tanner also from the Wikimedia Foundation who helped a lot in the formation of the project and the surveys. And we also have Olga Tikhonova, who was actually at a hackathon recently to help with this project, and we'll talk about how that went. I wanna make sure that when we talk about glam, uh, glam topics, we often find that there's an incomplete picture by folks in the glam community. So I always like to make sure people know about these resources. Uh, we had a gl full glam day before Wikimania started, and a number of people who said, I didn't know that. We're, you had a Telegram group the whole time, so I want to make sure everyone knows about these resources. So we have a GLAM newsletter on a wiki called Outreach Wiki, uh, and that is a monthly newsletter. It's a great way to catch up on all the GLAM activities happening every month. We also have a GLAM mailing list, which is not that active, but it's probably the most reliable way to contact the global uh, GLAM or cultural heritage community. We also have a Glam Wiki Global Telegram group that's quite active, um, but it can be, sometimes be too active, but I think it's a great place also to ask questions you need answers to very quickly, especially if you're like, how do I upload 100 images you know, with my Glam partner? You'll find lots of help there, and we're generally pretty friendly in that Telegram group. And then we also have an affiliate. We have several affiliates in this area, but the one I'm involved with is the Wikimedians in Residence Exchange Network. And despite the title, you don't have to be a Wikimedia in residence. Um, it's just a, a user group where we share experiences and we try to trade uh, stories and trade tools to do our jobs better. And it's through REN, we did a lot of this work to um, get the Wikimedia Foundation to fund this work. All right, so why are we doing this project? Well, some of you in the GLAM space might know that in 2022, we had a bit of a crisis with some of the key tools for uploading content, like Patty Pan, um, which is based on an Excel spreadsheet where you can upload lots of images. Um, they started to fail, right? So GLAM professionals were expecting easy to use tools to upload 100 or 1,000 images, uh, and Patty Pan was a main tool that was starting to fail because it was based on Java and there's a lot of old libraries, things like that. There also was a key failure in some major metrics tools we depended on in the GLAM community, right? The one key one was called Baglama 2. It showed you monthly stats for a category of images on commons and that was very useful for a GLAM institution that said, this is great, I can show this graph to my boss or my partner saying it keeps going up. And it was especially useful during the pandemic 
when their doors were closed and the museums had no visitors, we could still show, wow, we've got people on Wikipedia and comments visiting your content. Um, and then this led to a discussion in uh, 2023 about how do we move forward on fixing these tools and doing our jobs better because we start to see a lot of problems with us continuing our work with GLAM partners. So actually it was at Wikimania 2023 when Mike Dickerson, I don't know if he's here today, um, he did a great closing uh, comment when we had a panel when he said, if we don't fix these things, the position of Wikimedian residents will disappear. And I don't think he was being very dramatic because we were on that panel saying things have gotten so bad that we really are not sure a lot of these partnerships can continue. Okay. So it was in that climate that we start to see that there's a mismatch in many ways of the features that GLAM professionals wanted or were promising in many ways to their partners and some of the things that the foundation was supporting, right? So structured data uh, projects, for example, were, were a major part of this. Um, and then a desire for key community tools. Generally, if you know, Magnus Manske has created an amazing number of tools that GLAM professionals use, but it's always a best effort to support them. You know, you can't have Magnus, who's got a day job, to support all of our tools. But what might we do better to make sure that these tools that were just Magnus tools become more uh, supported over time? So this resulted in some writings online to try to document these t intangible ways. One was written by the Wikimedians in Residence called the GLAM Manifesto. And then this also fortunately led to the foundation creating a page to try to capture some of our needs here. That was a starting point of better, better documentation, right? So the takeaways were there's some disconnect in expectations. Um, we were kind of retelling the GLAM wiki story over and over to folks, maybe new foundation employees or to new folks coming into the movement. And we really didn't have a great way of telling it from scratch to every single person, right? They had to pick up little pieces from different projects around the, around the uh, movement. And I think one big challenge for the GLAM wiki community, there's no single front door to understand how to get involved with the GLAM wiki side of things, right? So unlike writing a Wikipedia article or uploading an image, sometimes a GLAM institution has many different needs. They might start with Wikidata or they might start with editing a Wikipedia article. So we really don't have a single point of messaging or documentation for GLAM professionals. So that means it's very inconsistent uh, how we get the information out to folks. And then tracking, there are not great procedures for identifying mission critical tools so that we can elevate them to say, we need more support in these areas. All right, so that was against that background that we now had a proposal at the end of 2023 to say, let's identify some of these motivations and needs from the GLAM wiki community um, to measure tangibly. So it's not just, you know, I heard or a lot of people say, we actually have some survey data to bring to the foundation and to the community. And then assess common workflows, see where, where the, you know, the well, well traveled paths are, what are the tools that are being used more than others, and then to document key user stories. I think this is the, the big thing, is that we didn't have great user stories for foundation staff to understand what we were doing. So um, this all against the backdrop of a lot of the work that we're doing at Smithsonian. I just wanna hand over to Sarah and Ryan to talk very quickly about um, the, the, the context in which the Smithsonian is engaging with the wiki community and, and how we're moving this forward. So, uh, Ryan, yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, my name is Ryan King. I am the program manager for the Open Access Initiative and Digital Programs at the Smithsonian. Uh, thanks for joining today, and both in person and online. Um, the Smithsonian is a complex of over, oh, well, a complex of 21 museums, libraries, nine research centers, and the National Zoo, all um, for the mission of the increase and diffusion of knowledge. And as a public institution, we wanted to have our digitized collections, the metadata and the research behind those collections um, as widely distributed to the public as possible. So starting around 2018, a team of over 100 Smithsonian staff volunteered their time on nine different implementation teams to launch the Open Access Initiative um, to the public in February of 2020. Those teams were looking um, at topics along the lines of open knowledge, open education, um, messaging, 
around um, collaborations and partnerships, as well as the technical infrastructure to make all of that happen on both our Smithsonian websites, um, both centrally, as well as each of the unit websites um, to make a consistent user experience connecting and sharing those assets, as well as conveying rights information. Um, we have over 21 million assets digitized currently. Um, and at the launch period of February 2020, we were able to release 2.8 million of those as CC0 op um, open access. Because of the tech implementation side um, and the workflows that um, we were able to set forth in each unit, um, museum staff can continue their work and add to that collection over time. Um, so since 2020, we are now at roughly 5 million digitized assets, and that continues to grow. On top of that, we released an open access API um, so that other individuals, um, programmers, university groups, or open knowledge um, collaborators can pull from our collections, um, you know, investigate connections among those, tell digital storytelling through their products um, and other platform. Um, and Wiki is one area where um, we saw immediate need to um, engage with and um, use our collections. And it's been um, very insightful, not only to help share information out, but also to see where there's gaps in our, our metadata, gaps in our collecting process, uh, practices historically, um, and how we can kind of use that information now to help remediate um, some of those gaps and to be um, accessible in all senses of the word through the open access initiative, through our other digital initiatives going forward across the institution, um, and thinking largely now about what digital transformation means for us as um, the Smithsonian Institution, but also for the wider GLAM sector and how we engage with the American public and users around the world, both in person and online. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over now to Sarah Snyder to speak more fully on that mission alignment, um, the strategy going forward, and um, where we hope to see um, and continued involvement with um, various aspects of the Wikimedia family alongside our work um, in the cultural, historic, and scientific spaces. So thank you. Thanks, Ryan, and I'm so glad you could come to your first Wikimania. So really <laughs> glad to have you with us today. Um, I'll be very brief. My name's Sarah Snyder. I started working on Wikipedia in 2007 and learned you know, along the way what this movement is about and have just been really enthusiastic about bringing uh, Wikimedians into the Smithsonian since we hosted our first Wikimedian resident in 2011. So uh, it's been a privilege to have Andrew as our Wikimedian at large. I've moved from being in the art museum space now to being in the central office, the Office of Digital Transformation, whose mission is to take this 178-year-old organization and bring it into the digital age um, with uh, energy and, um, and flexibility. And you know, one of the first things I realized being in this sort of central role looking across the whole organization is that we need to provide more support for the people who are interested in um, collaborating with the Wiki community. Uh, so having Andrew there and also, you know, future possibilities for additional um, collaboration or help, we're so happy to have been partnered with the Wikimedia Foundation and have their support in this effort. Um, I also really can't move forward without acknowledging the incredible shoulders we stand on in the work that we're doing. And I wish she could be here with us today to see how far we've come, but all of this builds on the work of our community member and friend, Effie Capsalis, who we lost in 2022, but I know is, um, is with us in spirit today and would be really proud of how far we've come. So I just wanted to introduce myself to everyone. If we see each other uh, in the halls, I'd love to talk about Glamwiki and love to talk about the Smithsonian, but um, for now, I think I'm gonna let Andrew carry on um, and talk about how what he's learned in his context of doing this study applies to all kinds of uh, Glams around the world. So we're glad to be able to, to host him. Yeah, as Sarah said, both, both Sarah and Effie were great friends of the Wiki movement before it was cool for <laughs> museums to all do this. So when the Glam Wiki movement really started to take off in 2010, um, Sarah was at the uh, American Art Museum and she was one of the first to line up and say, yes, let's get our paintings up there. Even before the official open access program was launched, 
So we were just like, is this uh, public domain? It is, let's get it up onto commons, which was great to see. Uh, so what do we do? We started with a survey for the GLAM CSA project because we thought this is the best way to capture as much um, structured feedback from our community as possible. So we worked with the foundation on Lyme survey. If, you, if anyone wants a best practices lesson, Lyme survey over Google Forms can do wonders for our community because every time you send out a Google form, you will get 10 emails back saying, I would participate if you didn't use Google stealing my private information. So it was great to start with Lyme survey and get no complaints and even some compliments by using Lyme survey. So no word to the wise. Uh, so Lyme survey, we structured the um, questions around feedback from the GLAM community. We listed some tools saying, do you use these tools or you can free response other tools you've used. What are some motivations for either your organization or your own engagement with GLAM wiki projects? What kind of obstacles might you face when Doing, dealing with Glam Wiki projects. And uh, we got great set of responses. We primarily wanted to focus on Smithsonian and US, but we also want to open up to the global community. And it was great to see some of the, the learning patterns that came back. We also were able to do things in person. So at the hackathon that we had in Tallinn, Estonia earlier this year, um, Olga Tikhonova from the Wikimedia Foundation helped to interview, um, and we sat down with a lot of folks, uh, many of, of whom are here in Wikimania, since we're so close to um, a lot of the folks who went to that hackathon. And we were able to share stories and get feedback from folks. In fact, I might call on Darina to come up and tell us about her stories in a second. In a second, I won't put you on the spot yet. Um, and we drafted a first set of user stories based on these interviews with those folks. And so what we saw were areas of concern, uh, from just talking to folks and seeing the survey feedback was uploading media files and content were a big concern for folks, working with structured data and commons, need for better metrics, which is a big one, and then desire for more innovative interfaces. So being there in person at the hackathon, we actually were able to have people not just say, I wish there were better interfaces. We had people come up with a tablet and say, this is what I want, you know, looking at mapping heritage projects, uh, looking at all kinds of different ways of visualizing cultural and heritage content was really useful to see. So projects like uh, Edge of Pike uh, Wiki Documentaries, which was piloted within the Wikimedia community uh, by Susanna Anas, but has not had more work on it. But these are just some of the uh, possible visually rich and multimedia rich ways of experiencing our content that have stalled in recent years. So what are some of the first results? Well, let's show you some of them. This was the most interesting thing to me, but what would you read from this graph that's interesting? So this is what projects does your organization contribute to? You can select as many as you like, and these are the numbers that came back. Anything interesting? What, what, what is interesting to you when you see this? I know Siobhan is an answer. <laughs> You can say your answer. Oh no, it's Jamie, yes. Uh, Wikipedia, is Wikipedia is third. <laughs> and Wikisource is pretty high up there, yes. We had uh, Nicholas Vigneron who was very happy to see that the other day. But what's fascinating is, you know, when we have talked to folks before saying, you know what, libraries and archives, yeah, Wikipedia is interesting, but they actually go for the metadata and the link data and the images more than anything else. And it's just great to have numbers that back that up. Right, to say that Wikipedia, yes, of course, fifth largest website in the world. But when you talk to GLAM institutions, often it's Wikipedia's over there. We want to get to the, the metadata and the multimedia, which is fascinating to see. So that's really great to see that Wikipedia is just one of th these three sites that make up the Wikimedia verse. I want to make sure I also show you this graph. We spent a lot of time on this the other day at the GLAM Wiki Day because how many people have seen this diagram before of the linked open data tools? Ah, oh, like a third of you, a fourth of you. So this is really useful, I think, as a one-stop shopping for all the GLAM tools that probably someone is interested in our movement. Remember I mentioned before, there's really no one front door for GLAM wiki work. We don't have glam.wikimedia.org. You have to maybe choose Wikidata, Meta, we don't even have much on Meta. So this is an attempt started by Sandra Fauconnier, and I've modified it so it's a little bit uh, simpler with six columns here, and just try to fill in all the tools that we know of 
in general for these different categories, right? So we're talking about preparation of any kind of data set you might be interested in, uh, the ability to reconcile it. In other words, I've got stuff, Commons has stuff, how similar or different are they, right? Am I duplicating things? Am I making new things? Uh, ingesting it, so the actual act of uploading or contributing content into the Wikimedia sphere. And then the ability to analyze and enrich it, right? So this is, if you talk about the extract, transform, load, uh, model or the extract load transform model, this is like more transforming the data once it's in the Wikimedia space. And then you wanna find out how do you reuse it? Are we putting the images into Wikipedia articles? Are we using the Wikidata entries to generate lists? You know, what kind of tools do we have to do this? And then finally, the big one is let's see the impact of what we've just done so we can assess whether it was worth it or whether we can fund more projects like you're doing. All right, so these are just kind of six simple bins here, but I think this is a great kind of one-stop shopping for the tools there. And we actually had a great feedback, <coughs> excuse me, session the other day where we said, what are we missing or what, are we, what could we do, do better in each of these categories? So what we did is we asked people with stickies, so we had a whole wall with these six categories, and we said, what are some edits or additions you want? What are some positive experiences you had with these tools? And then rather than say negatives, we said, what are some challenges in these bins or these categories? What are some challenges with reconciliation? What are some uh, positive experiences you've had with, with uh, analyzing the, uh, the use? So here's some of those outputs, which are pretty cool. So these are the post-its that were put up there. Any patterns you see here that might be interesting? I see at least two interesting things, but I'm sure there's many more. Any observations? And some of you in this room are the generators of these post-its, so it'd be interesting to hear your insights on this. Shivad? Well, I just think the ingest. In the ingest, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Sir. Hello, hello. Yeah. Yes. The ingest one seems to have quite a few more um, post-its on that. And then, of course, the report at the bottom, the challenges in the report, <laughs> it's massively <laughs> issues, yeah. Yeah, those are good. Those are the two big ones, I would say. Great. So I'm, I put little highlights there. So yes, I did not coordinate with Siobhan before, uh, before this, uh, by the way, but we're just, we're on that wavelength. We're Wikimedian laureates, right? So we're going to do that. So you can see here ingest. What's fascinating to me was the ingest had a lot of additions, and they're really specialized tools, right? So the ones that I did not document before, but were iNaturalist to Wiki, BHL to Wiki, um, which is fascinating, seeing that they're very specific tools for ingest. Um, and then, uh, obviously, in the report side, meaning our metrics tools aren't working great, and we heard it through those post-its there. Right? So even just by the volume of post-its, it's interesting to see the feedback there. But it also shows you, I think, we actually have some talent and tools to customize the ingest side, but maybe it's much harder to create the tools to fill in the needs for the other ones especially metrics, like metrics is kind of hard. You need to chunk through lots of data to get something meaningful. Whereas ingest is like, I got this one file, I need to get it there, right? And that's maybe an easier task. So those are pretty cool insights I wasn't expecting and I'm glad we did this exercise. So hopefully we can bring some of these results to the improvement of that chart. So if anyone's at this chart, it is at, on Wikidata and you just put in WD colon LOD, as in linked open data, you'll get to this chart. And we already improved this with some additions there, iNatWiki, do you see that, Shimon? We put iNatWiki and iNaturalist to Commons in there. So edit it, it's a wiki, add your own things there, please. Yes, and translate, you can see we've got it in, what, six, seven different languages already? So that's even, even better, more people can access that. All right, so here's the raw results when we said, what tools do you use? And you can check as many are relevant. And what's interesting here is it's a mix, right? It's a mix of either supported tools from the foundation or the media wiki community, or it's like number two is a Magnus tool, quick statements. And then we actually have a lot of gadgets like Catalot, which you haven't used before. It's a way to recategorize images on commons with a point and click interface, which is quite nice. Um, and then a lot of different tools down there showing you the challenge that there's a, a wide array of tools people use and to support them is, is quite challenging, right? So these are just some of the early results we're getting from the tools feedback there. 
And then I thought I'd just very quickly go through this because this is not key to the user stories, but it might be interesting for you to see some of this. Why does your organization contribute to Wikimedia projects? Please describe your organization's desired outcomes. And a lot of these may not be new to you, but it's nice to see them kind of cohesively described here. So outreach and public access, certainly, you know, contributing these to the Wikimedia side furthers the public uh, public outreach mission of an organization. Uh, content accessibility and preservation, right? So we know museums burn down and information is lost practically. Um, and we had our Brazilian community help uh, assist in recovering from that. So this is not an imagined risk, it's a real risk. Educational and cultural impact, right? Um, just getting a wider audience for the content that you have already. Collaboration and community building. This is really refreshing to see. We actually had partners that said, you know, they learn a lot from collaborating with the Wikimedia community because a lot, we may be very humble, but we actually have a really pretty advanced set of practices within our community for handling a lot of cases that some glam organizations are only hitting for the first time. Open science and data sharing, uh, skill development, institutional benefits, promoting diversity, inclusion, and longevity of Wikimedia as a platform. We've had a number of folks say, you know, I don't know where to upload this data set. Even my own GLAM organization doesn't think it's important enough to make a database, but Wikidata will take it. And that's kind of nice to see that Wikidata is kind of the default cultural heritage database that accepts so much information. Okay, and this is the big one. So we want to start documenting user stories that address this, which is what are the obstacles that people are running into when trying to contribute to Wikimedia projects. So here are some of the, the big takeaways from this. One is tool reliability and maintenance. Right? Just does the tool work <laughs> when we plan on using it? Uh, and we have many stories of folks who, you know, a tool broke or just wouldn't work halfway through a project or through an initiative. Uh, complexity and documentation. Again, you know, we have some really amazing tools, but sometimes the only documentation is a five-year-old YouTube demo of it. And it hasn't been updated or it's not on the wiki, it's only on YouTube. Right? Uh, metrics analysis, talked about this before, but the unreliability of some of our metrics tools and the lack of standardization. It's true, the benefit of having so many different developers develop really interesting, unique tools um, is that we have a diversity of them, but sometimes learning how to use PetScan is really hard because there's really no other tool quite like PetScan. It's, it's a unique uh, interface and sometimes some tools don't talk to each other very well. And then some data and metadata challenges, um, structured data and API issues, uh, metadata management. Right now, we are still cloudy on how to model some of the content in structured data on commons, right? So we're all kind of waiting around for someone maybe to, to solve this before we do a mass upload. And then resource and capacity constraints. So sometimes GLAM institutions don't have the bandwidth or the resources to put a lot of employee time or to dedicate a lot of time to these projects. So if we don't have tools or services ready for upload, that can be a blocker to participation. Um, and then one thing that some folks brought up is how do we create durable relationships or cooperative relationships, right? A lot of these glam projects are kind of one-time projects, but we actually should be having a community of practice where we learn better from each other and hopefully improve our practices over time. But sometimes this has been hard to do. Okay, and then when we talk about other community barriers, uh, notability and standards, right? It's, I'm sure you've all heard of a time when a GLAM institution uploads 100 or 1,000 images and then a comments admin, well, well, someone will nominate them all for deletion, right? And sometimes there's a mismatch between the expectations of the comments community and a GLAM that thinks that these images are within scope of comments or not. Uh, cultural sensitivity, um, we've had, cases of GLAM institutions uploading content and the curators or the archivists think it should be done a certain way, but we have folks who go in and either retouch or crop things that might not be to the same standards of the GLAM institution, which is interesting to see. Um, so these are just some of those things that we saw in the community and cultural barriers. And then just specific tool related issues, Patty Pan and Open Refine were mentioned quite a bit, uh, Wikidata and query services. As Wikidata has gotten bigger, the same query that might've worked six months ago, might not work today, just simply because of scale. And that's painful. That means I haven't done anything wrong, it's just that Wikidata is that much bigger and these queries just won't work. And we've been seeing more and more of those situations. 
uh, mobile and usability issues. Um, yeah, in general, we are seeing a lot more engagement in with mobiles and the GLAM community, but are we putting enough resources to do that? We'll show you an example of the ESA tool, if anyone's used that before, which has been really great for some edit-a-thons in Africa, but are we putting enough resources to keep those tools usable over time? Okay, and then also integration and visibility, finding the tools to track and the impact of these across the projects and workflow and process improvements. Um, linking all these tools together into a coherent workflow is sometimes very hard, even though an individual tool may be usable. All right, so why are we talking about user stories now? So that's a lot of preamble to now that we kind of see those things. Let's try to document some user stories that put those down into something we can address. So if anyone has ever you worked with user stories before, you might know that it kind of came from the software development world or the uh, business world. So the way we have it in Wikipedia, it says it is an informal, natural language description of features of a software system, but it doesn't have to be a software system. Um, they're written from the perspective of an end user. So you have what they call persona. You pretend to be a certain type of person. They describe their motivations. And they may be recorded in some kind of stepwise manner, index cards, post-it notes, lists, things like that. So we've taken to using wiki pages for these things. But today, I'll ask you to maybe try it using a Google Doc, because you can also in addition to documenting your user story, you can take screen snapshots and add things along the way, which might be useful. Um, here we go. So what are the three things that we're looking for in a user story? Well, one is a persona, trying to describe the background of the person that you're, you're working with, right? So this might be a museum manager with three years experience, or it might be a librarian who's looking to uh, have more of a gender balance or to contribute their their women's authors list to Wikipedia. Kind of the user scenario then, kind of what's the snapshot of the situation that exists now, and then their user journey, kind of a detailed documentation of the steps and their challenges and maybe some of the exact tools that they have worked with in the Wikimedia sphere. So right now we have three very detailed user stories, and one of them was actually uh, helped out a lot by Darina here on the Wiki Loves project, so I'll show you some examples of that. So here's just a very general example, and one of the rare useful things of using image generation by ChatGPT, you can actually say, here's a persona, make me a nice looking card like that. It was kind of cool. So here's Alex, a gallery outreach coordinator. Alex has been working as a outreach coordinator and wants to share the collection with a wider audience, right? So this is a typical statement you have in a user story. So as something in as someone in their role. I want to, and this is kind of their motivation for doing I want to upload high resolution images of artworks of our collection through Wikimedia Commons so that they're accessible to a global audience. Right. So these are kind of the three statements you'll typically find in a user story. And then the next part, this is a different user story, but the next part is kind of the scenario. And this is kind of a high level overview. So this is an example of uploading commons images. So you kind of find in this scenario, find the category of commons that you probably should be uploading your images to. Um, you'll find out whether your collection overlaps with the collections in commons. Um, you might dump down or download from commons what files are there, compare it to your own. And then you can upload what is missing or might be a higher resolution version of those things. And as a post process, you might enhance the media files with structured data on commons as kind of a, a post process. So that's an example of a very high level kind of a user scenario. But then what you can go deeper into so we can identify the exact tools that are mission critical to this is something like this. This is the user journey, right? So if you go deeper into this, this is um, an example of prepping the content. And in this case, we say, like most people, use a spreadsheet or a tool for doing this. And then you might want to this is very Wikimedia specific, right? Now I think most people who've done this kind of project, make sure you contact the volunteer response team if you don't own the content, right? You need to kind of send an email in to say, you know, I don't own the content, but I have permission from the people who own it to upload it on their behalf, and we have a record in um, VRT of that kind of transaction. And then we do a discovery process using some tools like PetScan or PY Wikibot. So for this scenario, I didn't put the whole thing here, but there's about eight or nine steps for this. But each one, I say, here's what the person wants to do. 
here's kind of the challenge or roadblock they might have, and then here are the tools that, that are involved. Right? So these kind of user stories are useful to uh, understand some of the motivations and the challenges for these things. So I thought maybe, Darina, you could talk about your experience in documenting it. And I was glad when we first met, she's like, oh, I want to tell you my story. So she was really eager to tell it. So tell us about your Wikiloves story. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Darina. I'm from Wikimedia Ukraine. And currently, I'm working on the Wikilove's Monuments competition. Uh, but actually, my main job is a business analyst in IT. <laughs> That's why I use stories. When I saw this like uh, topic, I understand that I need to go there. Uh, and uh, I must say that uh, how Andrew explains everything, like the structure and so on, it's much easier than in my current position at work. <laughs> so <laughs> congratulations, you did it perfectly. Uh, and uh, coming back to my user story, uh, it's about tools for uh, Wikilove's monuments and especially for the role of manager, because usually during the competition, which is only one month long, uh, we need to review a lot of pictures from the newcomers and uh, uh, our participants, and we need to see, like, uh, are there any categories missing, uh, or uh, probably there are some questions about the description of this photo and so on. And I noticed that uh, in the current tools, uh, it's very difficult uh, to see, like, uh, pictures uh, um, day by day, for example, and uh, I spent with my team uh, like several months after the competitions uh, to um, check uh, if the user fulfill all the categories and so on uh, correctly. So this user story is basically for the uh, improving of uh, our tools, current tools, uh, and I hope that it will be helpful so the team can um, like improve the tools and uh, the whole uh, teams of Wikilove's monuments can uh, uh, later use these like, tools in their work. That's all. Great. Thank so you. Stay here for a second. Yeah. I'm going to show them some other things here. So this is what you wrote, right? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so as you can see, my role is a uh, project manager, as I mentioned, and what I want uh, and uh, how I can uh, like uh, use uh, this improvement in my daily life as a project manager. Uh, here you can see also the screenshot of the current tools. Uh, and uh, you might see that uh, some of the statistics are not clickable. Some of them are. But still, it will be better if uh, the project manager uh, can be able to see statistics day by day and so on. And it will be very useful. So uh, what I found so fascinating is I had no idea these tools existed <laughs> until she demoed them and documented them in the user story, uh, like the Heritage tool and the Wiki Loves tool, right? So these Wiki Loves need some love in terms yeah. of software development, right? Yeah, so you can see that over time, it hasn't been updated in a long time. They just keep stacking the years there. From a user interface perspective, you probably want to do better than just stacking a year up there. But I don't think they have any developers right now working on this, right? And this tool is also used for Wikilove's Earth and for Wikilove's food, folklore, and so on. So it's very useful to improve it right now. Great. All right. Thank you so much, Darina. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, so these are just some of the, the types of stories and experiences we want to capture. We can probably imagine the ones that we've done ourselves, but to cast a wide net and see the range of things that people are doing in the GLAM community is really fascinating to see. So we actually have three pretty long and involved user stories uh, documented on Meta. We actually have two or three more that are not as long, but right now I, we put out these three for, uh, for more consumption. So the Wiki Loves one is based on Darina's, and we actually expanded to be even more detailed there. And then Wiki Scientists, uh, Women Scientists, about a reconciliation scenario where it's based on what we're doing at the Smithsonian, exactly, where we have experts on women scientists, and they're trying to find out what our list at the Smithsonian look like compared to what's already in Wikidata and Commons, and finding out how we can fill in the historical record that way. Right. So that, those are links to those stories, exactly. So your turn. So how do we get you involved with this? Well, let me show you at least one more graph before we get you to try this on your own to see, think about how we can get your feedback into the range of stories that we might be looking at. So let me give you a possible 
set of questions to consider what kind of stories we want to capture here. So number one is, are we confident, confident we're capturing a full range of user stories? And that's one reason why we're here at Wikimania and the Hackathon. We want to, we don't know what we don't know. We want to capture as many different types of stories as we can. How does your story fit into the stories of others? And are we understanding the frequency of use? So another part is that it's nice to capture a lot of user stories, but I'm not clear on how many people are running the same obstacles that Darina is. I can try to guess by how many Wiki loves projects there are out there, um, or how many people have this reconciliation problem. It's not clear. So we sometimes have to guess, but I'd love to get your feedback on better ways to measure those types of things. So let me give you an example of how we're trying to model this. So one is using a, a type of matrix. So if we look at a kind of a two-dimensional matrix here, we can look at maybe user stories as being simpler or more complex. I don't mean that they're simple stories, but that is the task or the workflow that you're trying to implement a more simple thing or a more complex thing, or the type of contribution, is it simple or more complex? That's a very broad uh, measure, but in general, you can think of it as you know, is something complex, evolved, technical, or simple in one click. And then on the other scale, in terms of the top to the bottom, are they large scale contributions or are they kind of single person, individual, small contributions? Right. So I think this is an interesting way to kind of map different type of user stories. Not to say that any one is more legitimate, saying that if you're in the upper right hand quadrant, you're a power user. No, there's different types of needs for this community. So let me throw one scenario out there and see what you folks think. So if we think like a Wikipedia edit-a-thon, where would you put it on this matrix? Is it simpler, complex, large scale, small scale? Where would you put a, a Wikipedia edit-a-thon, a typical one on here? Yes? It always depends, but uh, I would see it at a small scale for the simple reason that this is a kind of simple to um, organize. Yeah. <laughs> so Larissa said, yeah, you think it like a small scale and simpler to organize, right? Yes. I think I agree. Yes. So yes, you win. You win, Larissa. <laughs> it's just we thought the same way here. So yes, Wikipedia edit a thon. Typically, you know, even a big one is maybe 50, 60 people. And that's still fairly on the small side. Um, and it's simpler, right? Newbies, uh, you can work on whatever you want. Right. How about something like a local wiki base installation? Pretty complex, right? Yeah, so Siobhan says complex. Where would you put it in terms of the scale of contribution? What's that? Depends on the size of wiki base, that's true, right? You could be loading up millions of items, you could be making a tiny collection. Yeah, so it, in fact, it probably would be a strip. But let's just put it in the middle somewhere there, yeah, yeah. right? So good. So it's complex. Like if you ever, anyone's ever set up Wikibase, oof, it's still not that easy, right? Albin has, yes. Would you c concur? It's pretty complex still, even with Docker. Be nice. Depends. <laughs> <laughs> if you didn't say it's simple, then it's probably complex, right? Yeah. So yeah, it does depend on the tasks you want to implement there. So I thought this is a nice way to kind of map out different types of user stories and to make sure we're fulfilling a wide range of things, right? So something like the ESA tool. Has anyone here used the ESA tool before? Yes, raise your hand. So a lot of you might not have. Yeah, it's a really cool tool and especially mobile friendly. So we've talked to folks in, um, where's Benedict from, from the foundation? He ran an edit-a-thon in Africa with like hundreds of people using this tool on a mobile. And what you do is you just see an image and then you start typing in things in the depicts field there, and it matches against Wikidata. So you have these folks who are not experienced editors, but they can actually type in and say, oh, this is actually Porto Cove, because they either know the area or they are, have some information about it. And then you can actually have productive additions of structured data through a click interface on a mobile, which is pretty cool. So the ESA tool, where would we put that? This also varies quite a bit. Yeah, Giovanna, any idea? <laughs> it's pretty simple, right? We want to make it simple, otherwise you couldn't have hundreds of people. Yeah, so I think we agree. So small scale, simple, it's not the final word on it, but I think it's pretty cool to just try to map different things here, right? So let's say something like list reconciliation, I just put in the middle because it does vary quite a bit if you're trying to resolve one list against Wikidata or project-based image contribution, like you want to upload hundreds or thousands of images. It's a little bit more complex, um, but it's kind of medium scale there. 
And then if we want to add more to this, for example, Wiki loves photo campaigns, I'd say that's a large scale contribution, right? For one month or so, you have lots and lots of participants uploading content. Um, and then something like 3D modeling, you know, it's pretty complex. We're not talking about loading lots of stuff, but we don't actually support textured, colored 3D now. So that's why I put in complex, saying we have a lot of work to do to support true 3D models. Right? So I, I like being able to map and make sure we have a lot of different stories fill these different quadrants there. Now, to make things even more complex, or to more hard to describe here, so now how do we measure how often these stories are being told, or how, how common these stories are? Right? So I propose if we put a shading in here, you could actually start coloring them in. So this is one proposed way of looking at it. So you can see that Wikipedia edit-a-thons are pretty much on the higher end of frequency. You know, we have a fair amount of edit-a-thons. They're not happening every day, but they're happening quite often. Uh, but list reconciliation Wikidata, at least from the things that I've seen in the Glam Wiki world, happens a lot, right? Like, here's my data, how does it match Wikimedia data? Um, and then local wiki base, there's not a lot of people doing that, but the ones who are doing it are doing interesting things with it. So here's another proposed way of trying to track these stories and trying to measure the frequency of use. But if anyone has any insights on how to better understand how often these user scenarios and stories are happening in our community, I'd be very happy to talk to you about how we do this better. Right now, it's a lot of just you know, using the survey data and also talking to a lot of folks in our community. But hopefully this is one way of seeing how this might work to understand these different stories. And the reason why I'm showing this now is as I ask you to start thinking about a user story that you might want to try to draft today or to document today, it would be especially useful if it's in some of these quadrants that are less filled or they um, fill in more of the matrix here. And to think about where your story lies in terms of it being on the kind of simpler or more complex or the large scale or small scale. Again, being simpler and small scale doesn't mean it's any less valuable, right? Edithons are very valuable in our community, and here they are in simple and small scale, right? So think about a user story. You might have one in your head already that you could propose or start working on. And again, this in wiki fashion, be bold. Don't worry about whether it's the right story right now. It's just important to try something, all right? So here's some examples, I think, of tangible projects that fit into each of these categories. So at the Smithsonian already, we have a series of American Women's History Initiative edit thons that we've done. As I mentioned before, we have this thing called the Funk List Project that tried to upload women scientists content to Wikimedia projects. Oh, it's the Wiki in Africa edit thon that used the ESA tool for editing. Um, and then, you know, Rhizome, Smithsonian, we've been playing with uh, local wiki bases to try to um, link them to Wikidata. And then Wiki loves projects up there. And then what do I have here? Institutional collection image data. Okay, so that's large scale uploads. And then over here, we just think about what are the tools now in each of these pockets that are critical to getting those jobs done. So these are some of the tools we've identified as being key to those activities there. All right, so this is just an example of how we can start to break down each of these user stories as we start to put them in this matrix here. So hopefully that made sense to folks. It's a lot to consume, but you know we basically have types of events, examples of those, and then the tools needed to support those types of activities. And then hopefully once we see where the tools are succeeding or not succeeding, we now have a plan to figure out what are the high demand tools for which applications. All right, so before we get into trying things out, you feel free to follow the project on Meta at Glam CSI. Um, feel free to contact any of us, including Giovanna, if you have any questions or are interested in helping out with this. Um, and we're going to next be at Wiki Conference North America talking about some of these results here. So let's start some user stories. What I'll do is I'll describe it, and we'll kind of take a stretch break before we get started, because we was, we've been sitting here a while. Um, this is what we're going to do. We're going to create a user story, because I have a template you can use. And it's basically um, using, well, let me go back here. It's a template that implements this. So it's basically a template that has the, as someone, I want to do something so that you have this motivation. And then we have a template that has a user scenario that has a table like this that you can fill in. And then we also have a table like this that has a few examples that you should delete, 
but you should think about how to document a process or a flow in a possible user story. And I'd love to either have you capture something you've done already or something you aspire to do. Either one is good for this example. So what we're gonna do is give you a, sorry, there we go, give you a template to go to, and I'll show you this in a second, and then you can add your user story to the uh, shared document that we have, and then that'll allow us to kind of see some examples of what you folks are working on, okay? So let me see, there is the example there. What's that? Oh, it's not getting you to the, the right place? Oh, okay. Maybe you have to type in the bit.ly link then there. Okay, the bit.ly link works? Okay, thanks. All right, so, um, yeah, let me go to the bit.ly link and we'll show you that. Okay, can you folks switch to the Zoom? And I'll show folks. Ooh, thank you. That was smooth. All right, so this is the page. Hopefully you'll get to with that bit.ly link. I should actually record that bit.ly link there. I'll get that bit.ly link for you there. There it is. And I'll put it here as well. Okay, so that's this doc. And what you can do is add your user story to this. So what you can do is after you have loaded this up, you can click on this, load up the story here, and then go up here and say make a copy. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say user story for wiki shoot me. Has anyone here ever used wiki shoot me before? Yeah, it's a great way to use your mobile phone to add images to wiki data items by just walking around a town or something like that. So I go in here, and it's gonna make a copy of this document, so it's kind of ready for your filling out there, right? So I'm gonna keep all my author information the same, but you're gonna enter in your author information. Then I'm gonna say persona, I'm gonna say Jerry, enthusiastic mobile photographer, right? And then you can write a brief description saying, you know, they're not great at editing. Wants to contribute photos on his walks around town. Okay, then you can also fill in the user story. Basically, I've given you some examples here, but you delete that and fill in your own. And then you can type in user scenario and user journey. So again, I left in some of this, but you should delete that and enter in your own narrative there. Okay, so it'd be great to do that. Then what I'm gonna do is, as I'm working on this, I can go in here and copy the link. Actually, what I should do is hit share. I'm gonna say anyone can view it, right? Then I'm gonna copy the link to this document. If I go back to this one, Anyone should be able to write into this document here. So I'm gonna say, wiki shoot me person. Okay? So hopefully we'll have folks just kind of start adding their user stories there that we can take a look at. So again, you're starting here, clicking on this user story template, and then when you're looking at this, you shouldn't be able to edit this, but you can go to file and say make a copy and then name it something useful based on your user story. So we have about 20 minutes or so. So what you can do is take a bathroom break if you want or come back and then we'll have you work until 4.45. And then hopefully we can take a look at some of the stuff that you've done or answer any questions or discuss anything that you've run into um, while working on user story. Does that make sense? Good, all right. <clears throat> and if anyone wants to combine force with anyone, feel free to like let me know if anyone wants to combine efforts with someone else working on the same story.
Uh, I'm okay. I'm okay. Thank you. And I'll be working on one up here if you want to see one in action as well. So. Now we also do have links to an example if you want. There's the four examples, and that's one click away from seeing an example on Meta.
I'm okay, thank you.
what I've heard of it. Yeah. All right, we'll give you another few minutes. You can keep working if you've already done this, but I'll walk you through again to make sure your story is in our roster. All right, great seeing Camilla's story in there. That's awesome. So remember, you're going to paste in a link to your document here if you can. Ooh. So Camilla, maybe you can open up access, so make sure you make it publicly readable. I know, it's a pain. All right, so let's finish up in the next minute or so. And uh, some folks have some good questions. You might want to write a story about your general role as a Wikimedia in residence or a GLAM partnership. But then you might also want to write a more detailed one about a specific project within your role. And that's perfectly fine. We've seen several user stories like that, like a general user story and then a specific user story. So that's great. So as you're finishing up and making sure you're putting your story into the roster that we have here. Great to see them come in here. And make sure to make them public, so when I click on it, we can show them publicly. Uh, I'll show you one example that I did here. So again, as we mentioned, this is a an individual using the tool wikishootme.toolforge.org. Um, Jerry's an avid outdoors person and mobile user, wants to contribute images um, but he's not a great editor or anything, and commons is kind of hard to use. I should describe this better. But he wants like a one-click interface to upload things, and that's what WikiShootMe does. Right? 
So the basic story here is he uses the mobile app to plan out his walk. Uh, I'll show you what it looks like here. So this is what WikiShootMe looks like, and he will make sure that there's a number of red circles along the way. So a green circle in WikiShootMe means we've got an image for that Wikidata item. You don't, we don't need one. But a red circle says, if you click on this, you could really help us out here. So in this interface, it's pretty cool. You click on the red circle, and it has just a one button that says Upload Image. After you click on that, you take a photo with your camera, and that's it. Believe it or not, it uploads it to Commons with some kind of special name. You release it under a CC0 or CC BY license or CC0. I can't remember. Right. So it uploads to Commons with your name and everything. You don't have to figure out the categories or anything. And then it adds it to the Wikidata item right away, which is pretty cool. So. Um, it's probably the easiest way to upload images to Commons, although you haven't put in all the metadata that you might want. Um, but what's interesting about this tool, one of the things that I've documented here is um, WikiShootMe suggests Wikidata items of all kind, but it often suggests like movie theaters that were torn down 50 years ago. So you walk there and it's like, uh, there's nothing to photograph. Right? So in fact, Kevin and I were walking around a town once and we have kept hitting destroyed thing, destroyed thing, destroyed thing. We got nice exercise, but it was kind of unsatisfying after a while, right? So one thing that might be useful from this user story is to say, let's put in better filters, right? Do you want a persistent set of filters that say, don't show me destroyed buildings, don't show me another thing that happens all the time is organizations, right? The organization might have their office in this fifth floor of a building, but would you take a picture of the building to say that's the Red Cross um, of, of Katowice? Probably not, maybe, but they might not have anything distinguishable on the outside of the building. So you might want to improve the tool, given this feedback saying, we're seeing a number of people document issues with the tool when they're trying to use it in the field, right? So I think that's one of the values you can see here of having someone document explicitly the types of things they're going through when trying to use these tools there. All right, so let's say, I'll just, I won't click on every single one here, I'll just sample some of them if you're willing. But hopefully you're adding your stories here. That's great. Does anyone want to volunteer me taking a look at one of the stories or showing folks? Some people look scared. <laughs> Don't have to be scared. Yes, go ahead. Which one is it there? This one? Oh, great. Oh, good. Yeah, talk in the microphone. Tell us a little bit about oh, this. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, in 2017, we... We upload our collection, part of our collection. Now we have 30, 33,000 uh, items in our Glen. And we start in 2017. And uh, in 2020, we have a um, um, possibility of uh, promote many events in order to better qualify the, the collections and uh, Okay, and that is, and uh, when we um, we started, my great pre concerns are with the pro provenance of the data, mm -hmm. uh, how to 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 put this uh, visible, uh, explicit that well, this item belongs to the museum. This is where, uh, my my concern at the time, right? And also with the property rights. Because and then we could uh, make this separation of all what's in the public domain, right. and we have a lot of things because we are a museum of history with old items, so it's okay. And Giovanna works with us since the very beginning of mm -hmm. this project, mm -hmm. and so she put the the tools there. And then after we promote this event. And my challenge was mobilize my colleagues to take part of this, these events because only I am the only one very enthusiastic about this. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> but we we get we, we got um, many seminars uh, about the exhibitions that we will reopen in 2022. And uh, the collections were connected with these exhibitions mm -hmm. in the museum. And then, well, we finished after, in 2022, we, we reopened the museum. And since then, 
we are not working anymore with the gland. Well, it's there with the, all the collections, okay? But now I would like to, to start again with more events and uh, uploading um, more items. So that is <laughs> my story until now. Great. No, thank you. That's, that's very useful to see. I think one of the frustrations with the patty pan, it only supports like three templates or something like that. Right, so anything that goes beyond like artwork, photo, I can't remember the third one, then it just can't help you, right? Or you're stuck. A photograph, yeah, yeah. So that's uh, the patty pan's ability to add the metadata you want is limited sometimes by, by that support. Right. I'm sure Albin's looking into it, right? <laughs> Good. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, I just want to add something because I think one of, um, so we are still working on this together. Yes. Um, there is also something very interesting from this museum, a case that we had a kind of an education program with audio descriptions as well from mm. um, paintings. And I think it would be nice to add this as a journey as well, because it is a part that we are not really talking about right. in the community right now. And how we, we like we have this conversation before about how we are treating other types of media and not only um, images. Right. And right. so I think that's an interesting aspect. Maybe we can start a, a journey from that. Yeah. Yeah, because our museum, we are very concerned about accessibility. Mm -hmm. And then with the audio description of the, the items, and was a pilot program in 2017. Not very good, the first one, but we are now working more with this kind of description of the items and uh, right. maybe mobilize um, uh, in artificial intelligence for this. Right. To describe, and then we can, um, I don't know, check if it's okay and uh, connect it with the items because we have 100 items, uh, digitalizations, in digitalizations in our collection, so many. Right. So only with, <laughs> like this, <laughs> we can finish the, the, but you have a lot of, more than 100 with descriptions right. by now, audio descriptions. That's yeah. great. Yeah, thank you so much. Siobhan, you want to show us something? Okay. Okay, so I've got a thing where, this is a very old workflow of mine, um, and I had to sort of dredge it up. Um, <laughs> women scientific illustrators. This has been a passion of mine for ages. Um, I've moved on, I would still love to go back to it. So I tend to make a list of the women si illustrators I um, prepare the metadata. It's sort of like a two-hit thing. Prepare the metadata, and um, then I've got a huge website, uh, a huge um, spreadsheet, Google spreadsheet of them. Find all their identifiers. I tend to work with dead women, so not normally the orchid, but if there are living uh, illustrators, I will put the orchid if it exists, which doesn't often. Right. But they may very well have via if they certainly would have a Stuttgart Scientific Illustrator database ID because I get them to create that identifier if they don't already have them in that database. Mm. Um, then I add the women to Wikidata with identifiers, um, often manually if I'm really doing a deep dive into the research on the woman, but sometimes via um, quick statements. Possibly it is possible to do this via OpenRefine. I didn't know have any OpenRefine skills when I was doing this workflow. Um, but I'd probably do it now, put the thing in Open Refine and work for work on it in Open Refine now. Right. Um, then I'd find images of them probably by text search, um, a full text search in BHL, and I'd download all those images to the computer. And then there's a BHL template that I'd like to use, but um, some this is where my technical savvy comes up against um, just goddamn get them into wiki commons <laughs> so and then um i upload the images now previously i'd do this via patty pan then patty pan got broken now i'm aware alban's working on it massively um and then i would go about um putting them into categories and then adding the data the structured data to them via the structured data on commons tool right. but that's restricted it's it doesn't add as much data as i will have so ideally, I would like actually to be able to do it via a tool that bulk uploads and adds all my structured data right. all at the same time. Right. That would be my absolute ideal. 
Right, right. Yeah, Very and I'm cool. I'm hoping people are working on a tool that might <laughs> actually do that. Thank you, but I think you've described a path a lot of us take. Is like, okay, this tool only takes you halfway there. Yeah. Then after you upload, then you got to use the structured data tool and find out what did I upload, and that can be pretty tedious, right? Yeah, great. All right, thanks so much, everyone, uh, and feel free to keep working on them or make new ones and add to it. And always feel free to get in touch with me. You know, we're running this project for the rest of this year. Um, but Wikimania is a really important halfway point or more than halfway point for the project. And it's just great to get your feedback on it and get so much uh, enthusiasm around this, this, um, this documentation of your workflows. And we've seen a lot of interest in this type of activity to the point where other folks are saying, wow, we can do this not just for the glam side. Like we're trying to talk to the foundation about what we want to have in commons in the future then shouldn't we be documenting Wikimedia Commons workflows like this? Like, we could. That would be a kind of an interesting thing to see. In fact, it's a much wider type of community, but it would be great to see, you know, different personas that we're capturing in the common space or Wikisource space and go deeper and more narrow as well. So thank you for your attention. Thanks for all the feedback and hope you found it useful. And we'll see you around. All right.